Good evening. Thanks very much for joining us on India Business Hour. I'm Shireen Bhan. We're coming to you live from our new studios in the capital. And here are the headlines that we're tracking this evening. The Sensex and the Nifty hit a record high for the second straight session. The Sensex gains over 250 points. Nifty ends above 19,700. Mid-caps also hit an all-time high. HDFC Bank delivers a steady quarter. Standalone net interest income and profit meet estimates. Standalone profit growth of 30% is the best in 14 quarters. Asset quality remains stable. The board of Z Entertainment constitutes an interim committee of senior executives to run operations after SEBI barred Puneet Goenka along with Subhash Chandra from holding key managerial positions in a listed company. Both promoters have one more week to represent their case before SEBI's whole-time members. The global CEO of Alstom is upbeat on India after emerging as the lowest bidder for the one-day Bharat train project. Alstom CEO says the company is in talks with the railways to finalise the 30,000 crore rupee contract to build and maintain 100 aluminum body trains adds it's not a renegotiation but a discussion. That's an exclusive. The Financial Stability Board finalizes the regulatory framework for crypto asset activities. The framework makes it mandatory for service providers to have an enforceable legal basis for their activities. Regulations in crypto asset markets must be equivalent to those in traditional markets to prevent circumvention. India and the U.S. are among the closest partners in the world, says Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, holds bilateral talks with Finance Minister Nirmala Sitaraman on the sidelines of the G20 summit in Gandhinagar. A lot of work to be done to make it attractive for them to come here. And that's one of the reasons why we've created this private sector investment lab. World economy requires uh, coordination, so policy actions taken in different countries align. The new president of the World Bank, Ajay Banga, says private investment is flowing more into developed economies, adds emerging markets need to do more. IMF Chief Kristalina Georgieva calls on the world to align its policy actions at the G20 Finance Minister's Summit. The sentiment across India's manufacturing sector remains positive. 57% expect higher level of production in Q1 as per a FICI survey. 28% expect higher exports amidst global headwinds. The survey calls for easier credit access to small and medium enterprises. Temasekai is $9 billion bet on India over the next three years, looks to double down on its investments in digital companies, remains bullish on opportunities in financial services. China's economy expands 6.3% in Q2, falling short of market expectations, a slowdown in exports and declining property prices hurt consumer confidence. Youth unemployment rate hits an all-time high of more than 21%. Wheat price soar after Russia terminates the Black Sea food grain deal hours before the deadline expires. This comes on a day when two people died in what Russia claims to be an attack by Ukraine on the Crimean Bridge. Well, first up, the day's market action. The Lal Street scaling new peaks for the second consecutive session. The Sensex and the Nifty gained close to a percent today, with the Nifty breaking above the 19,700 mark. The mid-cap index underperformed in comparison, but still gained a quarter of a percent and hit record highs. Banks were the star performers, with the bank index soaring a percent and a half. The Nifty IT index hit an intraday high up for the third straight day. BSE companies' market cap has hit a new record of 303 lakh crore rupees. Commodity market action where oil prices dip as Libya resumed production over the weekend. Weak economic growth from China in the second quarter has also weighed on prices. China's GDP for Q2 grew by 6.3% from a year ago, missing expectations. This on the back of weakening demand at home as well as exports. Now, back home, the government has reimposed the windfall tax on domestic crude production after a gap of two months. So now the windfall tax, which was cut to zero from 4,100 rupees per ton in the month of May, now stands at 1,600 rupees. The special additional excise duty on export of petrol, diesel and aviation turbine fuel remains unchanged. The big earnings of the day, HDFC Bank has delivered a steady set of numbers in the first quarter. The bank's standalone profit and net interest income have met street expectations and estimates. Net profit has risen 30% year on year and this is the best the bank has seen in the last 14 quarters. Ritu joins us now with the key takeaways from HDFC Bank's earnings call. Ritu, take us through 
the management commentary that's coming from HDFC Bank. Well, first a disclaimer, uh, look at the numbers in a standalone fashion because the merger, although it has come into effect now, is only effective this second quarter. That said, it was a steady quarter, numbers more or less in line with street estimates. The top line growth, uh, which is the NII, which is the core income, registered a 21% growth year on year, led by a near 16% growth in advances. Profits were up nearly 30% on the back of higher core income and lower provisions. And this, like you said, is the best growth that the bank has seen in or delivered in 14 quarters. But the core income was flat, and we asked the management about that at 4.1%. It's a tad lower than what we typically see from HDFC Bank. Perhaps, uh, however, going forward, they believe you know with the merger synergies, this will likely expand. Uh, um, uh, you know, asset quality or gross NP that increased marginally at 1.17 percent, and net NP at 0.3 percent, still a good number compared to the industry average. Uh, and the management also said the slippages were at 5,800 crores for the quarter. But the big issue really has been the weak incremental deposit market share. Now, deposit growth for HDFC Bank has been lower than the industry, and it also lost some market share during the quarter. But the management, again, when we quizzed them about that, were confident in the long-term story, and they said the focus will continue to be on branch expansion, etc., to ensure that deposit continues to accrue. A quick word on attrition as well. The management told us uh, that even though the bank added 29 thousand employees in the last financial year attrition is quite high at nearly 30 percent and it was as high as 40 to 50 percent at the entry level position and 20 to 30 percent at a few levels above that but they said they're working on more training programs to hopefully counter this trend going forward all right Ritu, appreciate you joining us that is hdfc bank's uh, management commentary for you the other corporate story that we're tracking tonight the z entertainment board has constituted an interim committee of senior executives to run operations now this move comes days after sebi barred z's promoters puneet goenka and subhash chandra from holding key managerial positions in a listed company z shares ended the day seven percent higher yash joins us now with the details yash what does this now mean for the company and what does the road ahead look like well shireen uh, let's just first understand uh, what was the requirement to uh, form this particular committee, interim committee. Uh, market regulator SEBI had passed an interim order restraining Puneet Goenka from taking any position of directorship in a listed entity. Uh, this was on allegations of siphoning of funds and this order from SEBI was challenged by Puneet Goenka before the Securities Appellate Tribunal. Uh, the Securities Appellate Tribunal also did not give any sort of relief to Puneet Goenka and sort of upheld market regulator SEBI's order. Uh, it is because of this particular order and SAT's uh, uh, upholding of the SEBI order that uh, this uh, interim committee has been formed uh, by Z Entertainment Board, which will be under the supervision of Z Entertainment Board itself. Now, let's just understand how does this impact the big merger between Sony and Z. Remember, NCLT, hearing that merger matter, has also reserved its order. That order is expected sometime in the first week of August. On the other hand, uh, Puneet Goenka has been ordered by SAT uh, to sort of present his case before SEBI, uh, convince SEBI the allegations against him are, are not true and that there is no material in those allegations. That order is also expected sometime around the first week of August. It will be very interesting now to see what comes first. Is it the SEBI order, which is with respect to vacating or continuing the order against Puneet Goenka, or the order from NCLT giving a go-ahead to the merger between Z and Sony? All right, we will be tracking both those developments closely. Yash, appreciate you joining us here on the show. Now, the big newsmaker this evening, the global CEO of Alstom, is bullish on India and his company's growth prospects here. Speaking exclusively to us, Henry Lafarge said India has been a fantastic growth story for Alstom and its turnover has grown 40% this year. He also said that the company is in talks with the Indian Railways to finalize a 30,000 crore rupee contract for the Vande Bharat project. Alstom has emerged as the lowest bidder for the Vande Bharat project to manufacture and maintain 100 aluminum body train sets at a cost of 151 crore rupees per train set. Alstom CEO said the company has quoted a good price to the government and added that talks with the government are not a renegotiation but a discussion. Listen in. Let's talk about the big opportunity that seems to be opening up, and that is the Vande Bharat opportunity. You've emerged as the lowest bidder, uh, L1, as far as that over 30,000 crore rupee order is concerned. But there are reports suggesting that there is a renegotiation underway with the government of India. Uh, can you shed some light on that for us? Well, first of all, let me outline how important is this uh, contract. 
it's, it's the first time that we will put in India an aluminum technology at large scale. So we are going to deploy this technology, which we don't yet have in India. We have stainless steel uh, technology, but we have the aluminum now uh, technology, uh, which will allow us to implement a hub for the export, an aluminum hub for the global export. So it's an extremely important, of course, project for Indian uh, teams. It's an extremely important project for Indian railway. So I will not call it renegotiation, as, as always. Uh, we, are, uh, we have conversation with Indian Railway to finalize the project, finalize the contract. As you can imagine, for such a large project, there are a lot of discussions, and we are discussing, and I'm very confident that we'll uh, achieve these discussions. Uh, but part of the discussion is the ask from the Indian government to bring down the price even lower, because I believe that it was set at 151 crores per train set, which was 11% lower uh, than the next bidder, which was your competitor Stadler. So uh, what is the ask of the government as you conduct these conversations? Well, first of all, we believe that we made a, a very, very uh, good price for this uh, 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 trains, of course, and, and you don't expect me to, to share with you all the day-to-day the -day dialogue that we have. I mean, this is what, we, um, again, I'm confident that we'll finalize uh, the, the contract. Again, it, would be a, it is a fantastic project for Alstom, for the Indian Railway, and uh, for the Make in India in general. Uh, but y while you can't uh, discuss the specifics of the contract or the price negotiations, what's the timeline by when you expect clarity on moving forward with this? As soon as possible. <laughs> as soon as possible. And what will that? Eventually, if this gets done and whatever price it gets done at, what will that mean in terms of operationalization of this? Uh, and you know, what kind of investments will you need to make to be able to cater to this opportunity? So one thing which is important uh, to know is that, uh, again, this will be a new uh, technology. So we are starting, actually, to invest in terms of capabilities, in terms of know-how. So in Bangalore, we have a large engineering team to design these trains. Part of the trains and the aluminum technology will be done uh, as well uh, in the state of Gujarat, so in Savli, where we are going to uh, uh, manufacture the, the body shell and uh, within the, the, the sites of, uh, of Indian Railway. So it's a, it's a several sites which will be involved, uh, which will need heavy investment, both internally in Alstom and on the sites of Indian Railway. Well, that's the global CEO of Alstom on the Indian Railway opportunity. The Financial Stability Board has finalized a global regulatory framework for crypto assets. The FSB has recommended regulations to be equivalent to those in traditional markets. Our colleague Parikshit Lutra is in Gandhinagar at the G20 summit, and he joins us now with the latest. Parikshit, many thanks for joining us. Uh, uh, this has been long awaited uh, the FSB finalizing the framework take us through the details well this is uh, extremely important remember the financial stability board was formed in April 2009 just after the 2008 global financial crisis and their aim is to promote uh, global financial stability now this report which coincides uh, with the G20 negotiations on cryptocurrencies today says that uh, every country must have the power and capability to hold cryptocurrency issuers accountable, make them comply with local laws and take corrective actions if these crypto issuers do not comply. Uh, at the same time, every crypto asset service provider must be made to have an enforceable legal basis for their activities as well. Uh, regulations in crypto asset markets must be equivalent to those in traditional markets so that there is no circumvention and evasion of laws as well. Uh, countries with large crypto exchanges and large crypto issuers must be sharing information with other tax authorities, investigating agencies and other nations as well. This is critical as part of the global crypto framework. Uh, they have also said that every crypto asset issuer must have direct and clear lines of uh, accountability and a risk management framework as well, risk mitigation strategies to protect users also. On stable coins, they have said that there must be very strict disclosure norms for uh, users and redemption norms as well in case of any risk. Uh, this uh, report will now go to all G20 members. There is also a synthesis paper that the G20 has mandated the FSB and IMF to come up with together. That will be circulated to all G20 leaders just ahead of the leader su summit in September. But here at uh, the G20 venue in Gandhinagar, the sense that we're getting is that there's still a lot of divergences among different stakeholders, among different countries, on how they should pro proceed with a common framework on cryptocurrencies. So India may come up with some sort of roadmap or may set a, set a plan for the next presidency of the G20, but uh, any kind of consensus at this meeting looks difficult at this stage.
All right, Parikshit, appreciate you joining us. Parikshit Lutra there reporting from Gandhinagar saying that while the FSB has put out a framework on treating crypto assets, it's unlikely that there will be a consensus on this at this meeting of the G20. Now, crypto assets along with Global Debt Ukraine, Digital Public Infra took the center stage as finance ministers of G20 nations met in Gandhinagar. Finance Minister Nirmala Sitaraman held bilateral talks with the U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen. Yellen said India and the U.S. are amongst the closest partners in the world. Our discussions highlight the commitment of India and the United States to actively further the G20 agenda, facilitating consensus to intractable issues associated with rising indebtedness of low- and middle-income countries and harnessing opportunities presented by crypto assets and digital public infrastructure for financial inclusion. The United States and India are among the closest partners in the world. The United States is home to the largest Indian diaspora outside of Asia, and it serves as India's largest export market. We look forward to working with India on an investment platform to deliver a lower cost of capital and increased private investment to speed India's energy transition. Private sector money is literally getting flowing into the developed world even more than it is into the emerging markets. And so there's a lot of work to be done to make it attractive for them to come here. And that's one of the reasons why we've created this private sector investment lab, which is going to be co-chaired by Mark Carney and Shriti Vadera with 15 CEOs from asset management companies and operators. And the objective is to go through what holds back? What's the barrier that holds back this growth of the private sector that we want to invest in? The uh, world economy requires uh, coordination, so policy actions taken in different countries align. And this is what we are achieving here. What it would result in is better policy coordination and uh, more efforts to overcome the fragmentation that could affect uh, developing and emerging market economies uh, more than any the advanced world. Well, that's all the action from the G20 summit currently underway in Gandhinagar. Now, the sentiment across India's manufacturing sector remains upbeat, but exports continue to face a headwind on account of the challenging global environment. These are the key findings of a survey conducted by industry body FIKI. More than 400 respondents across nine sectors were polled to study the trend in Q1. 57% of those polled expect high level of production in the April to June quarter. The average increase in production is likely to be in single digits. 28% of those polled expect higher exports in Q1. The optimism across the manufacturing sector is not uniform. The electronic and wide good industry is most upbeat, expecting more than 20% growth in Q1. But metals, textiles, apparel, toys and handicraft expect moderate, low single digit growth in the first quarter. Well, you can catch our full conversation with the FIKI officials and industry leaders at 9.30pm right here on CNBC TV18. Time for us to head into a short break, but up next, a potential change of guard in the world of tennis. 20-year-old Carlos Alcaraz defeats Djokovic in an epic Wimbledon final. We profile the rise of the young Spaniard when we return.
Singapore-based private equity firm Temasek is bullish on India and is looking to increase investments in Indian companies by three times to about $9 billion over the next three years. That's the word in from the investment company's India head, Ravi Lamba. Speaking to CNBC TV 18, Lamba said Temasek is doubling down on investments in companies in the digital space. Take a look. India has performed well. You know, we've been growing our portfolio quite nicely here. It's benefited a lot from the investments uh, that we made over the last sort of five, seven years, and then, of course, the rise in, in valuations and how the, how the economy is growing. Over the next three years, if we can find the right opportunities in the right construct, we can see ourselves deploying between seven to nine billion dollars in India. And that is, that is an uptick from where we were operating, uh, you know, for many years in the past. What we're seeing here is a, uh, is a reset of valuations, but not, not necessarily a reset of potential. The potential is still very significant. Uh, the, plat the, the runway is very long, whether it's e-commerce, whether it's fintech. Uh, you know, all of them are benefiting from you know, the digitization India stack. Uh, and we're trying to make sure that we can double down on opportunities and investments where you know, that, that potential continues to look really good. And, and we're a long-term investor. We're not bothered so much by year-to-year -year volatility. You know, we don't really look at the, you know, we don't look at the valuation uh, as an important test uh, in, in the short term, we look at it as something that plays out over the long term. We are invested in Ola Electric and you know, we see EV as a, as a theme, we see EV as a, as a, as a great way to play uh, what's happening in India uh, from a manufacturing perspective, from a make in India, you know, from the China Plus One strategy. There are many different reasons why we like EV uh, and of course our own path in, in terms of ESG. We see uh, Ola EV as a great uh, business opportunity where we will continue to think through as we put more capital to work. Uh, we have put a follow-on investment and as the company goes forward with fundraisings, whether it's IPO or whether it's private, you know, we will find uh, opportunities for us to participate in that. Well, that's Temasek on their India plans. Now, the center has begun selling discounted tomatoes in many cities, including Delhi, Noida, Lucknow, Patna, Varanasi. Why it's cooperative? Now, the National Agriculture Cooperative Marketing Federation has said the government is incurring a loss of 50 rupees per kg as it sells tomatoes at a discounted rate of 80 rupees. Abhimanyu Sharma spoke with consumers in Delhi who tell him that the discount or not, they will continue to be cautious with their spending. Government is selling tomatoes through these 23 mobile vans across the national capital and several other cities. We have seen crowds thronging this place since morning and quintals of tomatoes have been brought inside this van and the stock is fast running out. Uh, we have seen people uh, buying kilograms of tomatoes uh, after a period of several weeks and uh, people want this initiative to be expanded. However, the government is absorbing losses as of now since it's procuring tomatoes at as high as rupees 125 per kilogram and is selling it at rupees 80 per kg. The government, however, remains hopeful that fresh supplies of tomatoes will soon come into the market, which will naturally drive down retail prices even further. We are buying the tomatoes at 125 plus. And if you add freight and everything, it comes to Delhi at 130 and we're selling it at 80. So we are incurring a loss, but the government of India uh, has been, um, they has taken proactive steps so that the loss is not borne by the organization. We have sold it for about 5 hours. Because we had a truck full of truck, so we had 20 pounds of NCUI. And then we have 30 pounds of stock in stock, which you can see now. We have taken 2 kilos, and we have to say that the price is good from the bazaar, because in the bazaar, दो सौ एक रेट बड़ा बस बात ही बाईस के बाद वो उस बाजार में मतलब घर में टमाटर का बहुत दिक्कत होगी थी वही खुल कर नहीं करेंगे दो दो टमाटर रोज इस्तेमाल करेंगे बहुत महंगाई है हर सब्जी महंगाई है गवर्नमेंट hopes that the prices in the retail market are going to come down not just due to this initiative but also due to fresh produce of tomatoes which is slated to arrive anytime soon. It's also likely that in near future such initiatives may be undertaken for other commodities like onions too. In Delhi, with video journalist Akhilesh Kumar Singh, this is Abhimanyu Sharma for CNBC TV 18. Now, 20-year-old Carlos Alcaraz defeated Novak Djokovic in an epic Wimbledon final that lasted almost five hours. With this, Alcaraz has become the youngest player to win two different Grand Slams and has announced his arrival as a force to be reckoned with. Arunati Ramanan profiles the rise of Alcaraz from a small village in Spain to the pinnacle of tennis. 
Carlos Alcaraz heralded the changing of the guard in men's tennis as he ended Novak Djokovic's 10-year-long reign at Wimbledon. His victory in five grueling sets marks a significant milestone. He was barely five years old when Djokovic won his first major at the Australian Open in 2008. Well, it's, it's great to win, you know, but uh, even if I will have lost, uh, you know, I would be uh, really proud of myself, you know, in this amazing run, you know, making uh, history in this beautiful uh, tournament, you know. Grass, I, I must say that he surprised me, he surprised everyone how quickly he adapted to, to grass this year because he hadn't, hasn't had uh, too many wins on grass in the last two years uh, that he played. Alcaraz grew up in El Palmar in Mercia, a small village with around 24,000 inhabitants and in a family with an affinity for tennis. Alcaraz has won a total of 11 titles in his nascent career, including his US Open crown and four Masters. Former French Open champion Juan Carlos Ferrer has been coaching Alcaraz since 2019. Under his tutelage, Alcaraz became the youngest men's world number one. Being a Spaniard, Alcaraz cannot escape comparison with Rafael Nadal. After Alcaraz defeated Djokovic, Nadal said when his adrenaline goes up, he's practically unstoppable. Djokovic was unbeaten at the Wimbledon centre court for more than a decade. But Alcaraz vanquished him in what appears like the start of a glittering career in tennis. In Mumbai, Arundhati Ramanan. Well, the rise of Carlos Alcaraz. And with that, it is time for us to wrap up this edition of India Business Hour. From all of us here on the team, goodbye. Thanks for watching. Do stay tuned. The news continues after this short break.